Our Bible study, guys, is in John chapter 4. We're going to study a familiar passage here, the first 18 verses. I'll read it, then we'll jump right in. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee, verse 4. Now we had to go through Samaria. So we came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God who it, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And in verse 16, he told her, Go, call your husband, and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said, what you've just said, is quite true. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, this is a familiar passage to most of us. And if we, even if we know the story, we know the characters, Lord, some of us have even memorized this passage. The truth is, we know it so well because we can identify with this woman. Every single person in this room, every single person listening to this Bible study online is just like this woman in some form of an, or another. And because of that, Jesus, you extend your hand to her when nobody else would. You show your love to her when nobody else would. This is a woman like each and every one of us who is seeking love, looking for love. And Jesus, she comes to meet you today. If there's anyone here, Lord, that doesn't know you, that does not belong to you, Lord, tonight I pray that they would become born again. You will whisper into their ear an invitation to the well of living water. And I pray that they would respond and you would add to your family and that their life starting now would be brand new. And Lord, for the rest of us that are yours, maybe some of us are tired. Maybe some of us are doing well, filled with your spirit. Whatever it is we're going through, difficulty, hardship, or the best time in our life, Lord, this is a word for us as well. Refresh us with your living water. 
And if repentance is required, Lord, I pray that that too will happen for the believer. That you would pour your spirit into us and times of refreshing would come. These things, Lord, we live up, lift up to you, Jesus, because you're so wonderful. Amen. John chapter 4 is, like I said, a passage that probably most of you already know, have taught and have studied, and you're probably like me, when you read this passage, you think of a song. Just like me, you probably think of the exact same song that I'm thinking of. It was in the early 80s. And, I mean, I never knew anything about Texas growing up in Southern California, except, uh, let's see, J.R. Ewing. I watched on TV, so I thought everybody in Texas was like that. And then I saw the other side, which was... Um, a movie called Urban Cowboy. <laughs> Not a good movie. But as a kid, I already knew that that's, that's pretty messed up. <laughs> uh, but there was a song in that movie that even as, I don't know, nine or 10 years old, I remember. And it reminds me of this woman. I'm not going to tell you the song. I'll just read to you the lyric. I was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces, searching their eyes, looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of. I mean, that's this woman. That's us. And at some point in your life, you find yourself just looking for love, whatever you think that is. And most of us, if you're like me, you look in the wrong places for a long time. And there's a lot of heartbreak. That's the story of this woman. And I love how Jesus approaches her. He will approach you tonight as well. Whatever it is you're dealing with, maybe it's something in the past. Maybe it's pain. Maybe you're going through something right now that's really challenging and difficult. I want you to know this in the same way that Jesus reaches out to this woman that nobody else would talk to. He reaches out to you today. Verse 1. We're going to talk, we'll look at this in four different sections. The first part is sort of a background about Samaria. So this is about the location. The location. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. We talked about this last week. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples. So remember that John the Baptist, with his group, was also baptizing, and some of his disciples had come to John and said, hey, this is what's going on. And then John the Baptist corrected them. Verse 3 because he said this is what was supposed to happen all along. Look at verse 3, though. When the Lord learned of this, this being the fact that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples. So when the Lord heard of this, he left Judea, and he went back once again, once more, to Galilee. So geography here, location. There along the Jordan River, this would be to the east, baptizing people there. Jesus hears that there is a possible competition here among the people. He doesn't want ministry to be competition. And so instead of giving the Pharisees an opportunity to cause problems, he says, I'm going to go back to Galilee. That really was his home base for ministry. Ministry. So, if you're looking at a map, you have Jerusalem to the east, you have the Jordan, and then right above Jerusalem, you have the area we're talking about today called Samaria. And then above Samaria, you have the area called Galilee. The main city there was Capernaum. That's where Jesus would do his ministry. So he's saying, Jesus is, I'm going to head back. Let's go over there. That's where ministry is calling us to go. The location here is significant because look at verse 4. Now, he had to go through Samaria. We learn later on, 
In the next chapter, Jesus says this, I don't do anything unless my father tells me to do it. So that means he was being guided through Samaria. Why is that significant? Because in Samaria, there was animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. Many of you know this, but it had been going on at this point for at least 650, 700 years. 700 years of animosity behind, uh, between the Samaritans and the Jews. Why? Because the Jews looked down upon the Samaritans as sort of half-breeds. Remember when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, what their typical uh, tactic was, was to deport many of the locals. So this, in this case, those of the northern kingdom, they would send over to Assyria, which would be northern Iraq. Then they would take a bunch of the people from northern uh, Iraq, from Assyria, and they would populate this area in order to intermingle and mix cultures because they knew that this would weaken the rebellion. And so that's what's been going on since then. For hundreds and hundreds of years, a lot of animosity had been built up. The rest of verse, oh, in verse 5, it says, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, listen to this, tired as he was, from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which would be about 12 noon, the heat of the day. Now this is interesting, because Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? Because that's where the Father said to go. Even if all of the Jews would avoid that path to get to Galilee, it was by far the fastest route but instead, what the Jews would normally do is cross the Jordan to the east, go up through the area called Perea on the other side of the Jordan, and then cross back over when they get to Galilee. Much more mileage. But they would do this because they couldn't stand being around the Samaritans. And that was just the normal way of life. In, in, in the practical sense, this is how the Jews would view the Samaritans. They're not even worth talking to. They're not even worth sharing. They would have what they would view, the Jews would view, a compromised faith. Because again, mixed uh, with the, the Pentateuch, they would intertwine the pagan beliefs of Assyria. But not Jesus. And I love this. Jesus says, we're going to go. We're going to go through there. Why? Not only do I have a divine appointment, not only is somebody waiting for me, but these are the people, even if they're not the Jews, these are the people that need to hear the gospel message. They need to hear the hope that I've come to bring to this world. The first lesson, I think, for us is this. We don't want to be like the Jews. We know what it's like to have animosity we know what it's like to have built up, pent up resentment, anger. And what that does is it effectively, or, or it renders us ineffective. It renders us useless for the kingdom of God. It, you know, when you have anger, you have animosity, and it may even be justified according to the world. Maybe you have a reason because of what happened in the past. But what, what I want you to think about this evening is this woman, and we're going to learn more about her here in a minute. If anybody has a right to be bitter and angry, it's probably her. But as a born-again Christian, this will be a recurring theme for us here tonight. The old is gone and the new has come. That means whatever people have done to you in the past, Whatever you have done to people in the past, in Christ, is as far as the East is from the West, never to be brought up again. So we have no right 
to hold animosity towards people that have sinned against us. When Jesus says, you yourself have been forgiven of all your sin, this is the beauty of the gospel message. Now, I think intellectually we get this, and we understand this. It's the putting in the practice part that's a challenge. But th we're talking 700 years here, guys. You know what that tells us? If you don't do anything about it, it's not going to change. You harbor resentment for somebody, bitterness towards them. You know, just because they live in a different city now, just because you move away, they move away. Don't be mistaken into thinking that that resentment is no longer there just because you don't see them. It stays deep in our hearts. And what Jesus is saying to us tonight is this. This example of long-term animosity, no matter how well you think you hide it, it, it ruins your witness, and it renders you useless for the kingdom of God. Let's move on. It says here that Jesus was tired as he was from the journey in, in verse 6. I love this, that Jesus got tired. We get tired, and we should get tired. Physically, ministry is exhausting. It's tiring, but that's why Jesus gives us the power of his spirit. When I'm tired, when you're tired, uh, we need to rest. Why? Because if you are physically unable to serve, then again, you render yourself useless. But if you take care of yourself, you get rest. You are giving God like a full tank of gas so that he could use you in whatever way he wants to. Think about it this way. He has people at the beginning of your day. He has people lined up, ready to interact with you. He knows who they are. And he wants you to have the power of his spirit. So take care of yourself. Get rest if you need to get rest. Jesus got tired because of the work, but he never got tired of the work. You get tired from the work, you never get tired of the work. If you find yourself grumbling, complaining, then you're tired of the work. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. That goes beyond physical exhaustion. You're spiritually depleted. You need to plug in back to Jesus and get your heart right. Jesus got tired. He sat down. From the journey by the well, he sat down, and it was 12 noon, which is the heat of the day. Not the day you typically draw water. We'll look at that in a second. That's the location. We've got the background. We've got the area, the geography set up. Now, we move on to the second thing. Let's look at the lady. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water... Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Now, she's alone. It doesn't say that anybody's with her, which is odd. It's odd. Normally, it would be the women that go and draw water from the well. But normally, the women would not go in the heat of the day. And normally, the women would go together to help each other out. And normally... The men wouldn't talk to women. Well, we see all three of these things here, at least the opposite of them. And this is the reason why Jesus had to go through Samaria. I want to point out the fact that it being 12 noon is significant. If it's the heat of the day, it's not the ideal time to do physical labor. And that's exactly what it was at 12 but this woman would be somebody who would be sort of an outcast from the village. She would, have a, a, she would be a woman of, of ill repute, of bad reputation. We know her story. 
And so this would be a woman who, to avoid the dirty looks, the gossip, would have to resort to going and getting water in the heat of the day alone. She would go by herself. Now, if you've ever struggled with loneliness, you know the feeling of what it's like. It's almost like a, a, a dark cloud that hovers over you. And everything that you hear is over, like, you're hypersensitive to what people say, what people think. This is normal for people that don't have Jesus. It's not normal for people that know Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this woman. And now at this moment, she's not what we would call saved. She doesn't know Jesus. She's a very religious person. But notice, her religion has no benefit to her lifestyle. And this is a woman that in the heat of the day was drawing water all by herself. And the first thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth is directed towards her. Again, men would not talk to women publicly here. It's something that you just don't do. In the same way that Jesus had no problem going through Samaria, Jesus had no problem speaking, initiating conversation with the Samaritan woman. What does he say? Very simply, will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? He's not saying it in a way that makes her sort of like a, a slave or servant. What he's doing is very calculated. He is initiating conversation to reach this woman. Guys, Jesus is giving us a wonderful example of how to share him with people. Do you think this woman walking up to the well was full of smiles and had a glowing demeanor about her? Probably not. This would be a woman that most would say, I don't want to talk to her. She doesn't look like somebody that's very, she doesn't look like somebody that's going to make me happy. So that looks like somebody that could be uh, really taxing to talk to. So I'm going to avoid her, not Jesus. And this is the way we should approach people. We look for those that are hurting, not avoid them. Why? Because they're the ones that need to hear about Jesus. It was so sweet in prayer last week. Pastor Lane was sharing about his, uh, his third graders and what they did, some of the girls from his class did, at recess. At recess here, they go to the park, and they're playing, and there's obviously people there at the park, not just the students. Pastor Lane was sharing about his, uh, the girls from his class that were proactively approaching people. There was a woman who was approached by these third grade girls. And the third grade girls, just like Jesus here, initiated the conversation. Excuse me, do you know Jesus? They were sharing Jesus with strangers. Why? Because they had the message that they were convinced everybody needed to know. They didn't get intimidated by age. They didn't get intimidated by appearance. They were not intimidated by intellect or different levels of maturity. None of that mattered. You see, kids get it. And in the same way that Jesus initiates conversation with her for the purpose of reaching her, this is exactly what we should do. Just like the third, third grade girls. That woman at the park was going through something. She was a Christian, and, but the Lord was dealing with her on some things that very morning. And whatever that thing was, the Lord was dealing with her, was addressed very directly to the point that this woman had to go to the teachers and say, excuse me, uh, these girls, who do they belong to? 
And the lady went on to explain, I, I was mad at God. And God used these girls to rebuke me, to correct me. They didn't know that. All they wanted to do was share Jesus. You never know who's hurting around you. Jesus here knows this woman. So he initiates the conversation. Verse 8 gives us a parenthetical. It says, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food, so they weren't there. These two were alone in a conversation. Again, talking about the woman in verse 9. This lady, a Samar the Samaritan woman, said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Okay, it's obvious. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. It's one thing to go and initiate conversation with somebody that looks like they'll be easy to talk to. And you should. I mean, if you see somebody wearing a Christian shirt, talk about the shirt. Just because they're wearing a Christian shirt, by the way, doesn't mean that they're a Christian. But you can use that, and that might be an easy conversation or so you think. But you may see somebody sitting next to you in the restaurant, somebody in the grocery line, somebody that's complaining or somebody that's obviously upset, and that's the person that needs to hear about Jesus. That's the person that's really hurting right now. This woman is astonished that Jesus would talk to her because she's a woman. She's astonished that Jesus would talk to her because she's a Samaritan. And she's astonished that anybody would talk to her because she knows her past. She knows her past. This is a lady, and I say lady because this is how Jesus viewed her all along. He didn't look down upon her. She was the object of God's affection, and he treated her this way by being very direct. So this is the lady. Now, let's move on to the third part of our passage here, starting in verse 10. We look at the living water. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, that's himself, and he would have given you living water. Now, Jesus here is talking about the Holy Spirit. The living water is the Holy Spirit. Jesus later on would say, I am the bread, right? using a type to describe himself, the bread of life that comes from heaven. But the living water, he describes later on in chapter 7, to flow out, to stream out from the one who believes in him. So in other words, he's saying, we're here at a well, and we're looking at water. But that water isn't the water that you need. It is the Holy Spirit that is the living water. He is the one we need. Let's look at this closely. He says here in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God. Now, two words in Greek that describe or that are translated know. You know them, gnosko, and the other one is oida. This, this is oida, which has more to do with perception than gnosko, which is more like experiential, to know somebody relationally. And that's typically what we read in the New Testament. This word for know is actually better translated as see. It's talking about perception. So look at what Jesus says. If you knew the gift of God, if you saw the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In other words, if you Open your eyes, and you see what's in front of you. You'd realize. You would come to your senses, and you would come to me. You would come to your senses, and you would come to me. Whenever we are in rebellion, 
against God. When we are in sin, we are the one that strays away from him. Jesus is going forward still. Sin separates us from him. Jesus always woos us back to him through the Holy Spirit. That's called conviction. And Jesus is saying here to her, you're not really getting what's going on right here. You're thinking about water. What I have for you is living water. He says, but you've got to come to your senses. You've got to see this. And the two things he says you need to see is this. If you saw the gift of God, the gift of God is the newness of life. He offers newness of life to everyone that repents and puts their faith in him. This is an important fact because this woman, like many of us, we have a past where some of us may think, there's no way I can have a new life, a new start. I'm here to tell you tonight that yes, you can. You need to open your eyes, figuratively. Come to your senses and come to Jesus. He says this, the second thing, if you knew who it is that asks you for a drink. This is the Messiah that is speaking to this woman that nobody else would. She doesn't get it. And he's saying, if you know, if you knew who I am and what I'm offering you today, it's a no-brainer. You would take it. Now, for you here tonight, if you, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, when sin separates you from God, what he does is he offers you forgiveness. It's a no-brainer. Who would not want to be forgiven? Only the person that wants to stay in their sin. The person that wants to stay in their sin is saying, my life of misery is better than being forgiven. It makes no sense at all. Forgiveness, guys, is a no-brainer. The reason why we don't want it is because we love our sin more than Jesus. But look at the story, as the story continues, he says here, you would have asked him, he's talking about himself, and he would have given you living water. Not this water from the well. This living water is what he wants to give each and every one of us here tonight. And this is the power, the working power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Are you in a place in your walk with the Lord where you are stagnant? Things are sort of mundane. Maybe you're on autopilot and you're on cruise control, whatever analogy you want to use, you're operating apart from the power of God's Spirit. Why? Because the power of God's Spirit is always dynamic. Look at verse 11. He says, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? Again, she's thinking in the physical. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. She is saying to Jesus, he's saying, uh, I'm sorry, sir, but you really don't know the history like I do. So let me give you a short lesson about how sacred this place really is. She's focused on the physical. He's focused on the physical, just like Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus just in the previous chapter when Jesus said, you must be born again. His response was, you mean, how do, I, how do I go back into the birth canal? You're focused on the physical. And Jesus is saying, and Nicodemus would be the, the opposite on the spectrum of the socioeconomic structure here compared to this woman. It's the same thing, though. Whether you're wealthy or whether you're poor, whether you're I have a lot or you have a little. It's the same need we all have. We all have a need. 
to be forgiven of our sin. And so she's only doing what she knows, which is relate everything to the physical, to the flesh, to the earthly. And so she says to Jesus, this place is where, are you greater than Jacob? But he's the one that gave us this well. And then Jesus' response is so perfect in verse 13. Again, this is the living water. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, I love his response. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. He says, talking about the well, you guys make it a habit to come and pull water from the well because you need to feed your family, cook your food, tend to your crops. And so this practice of getting water from the well is part of your normal routine. But he's saying to her, won't you notice how often you have to come back? I mean, you probably don't even think about it. But the water that you pull from here, it runs out. It's not meant to last forever. But Jesus says, when you drink of this water, you're going to get thirsty again. Why? Because this water is just water. But whoever drinks the water that I give him, verse 14, will never thirst. Now the word for thirst is the same that's used for the physical as it is for the spiritual. So it's the same word, different meanings, and the context determines the meaning. But I love that because we all know what it is to be thirsty. When you get thirsty, your body is designed to crave hydration. Once you're hydrated, you're not as thirsty. But again, you will become dehydrated, and your body will naturally crave water again. So is it with our hearts. There is an emptiness that each one of us have, a void, if you will, that isn't satisfied by the physical things. It is a thirst just like you have a thirst for water, but this is a thirst for Jesus. Whether you realize it or not, your heart is hungry, is thirsty for Jesus. But just like the song in our intro, we take that emptiness and we force all kinds of things into that spot. It's sort of like, you know, when you do jigsaw puzzles, right? And you, you have an open spot and you have a piece that you think fits, and it looks like it does. But then you, as you start to put it in, you realize, ah, oh, that's not a good fit. What if you force it? And you probably could. It's soft cardboard. You can force it in there because I, I know this is the right piece here. Well, what eventually happens? You realize that's not the right place for that. It pops out. That's what we do with our lives. We've got a Jesus void in our hearts that we fill with drugs, we fill with sex, we fill with money, we fill with fame, we fill with career, we fill with good things, we fill with bad things. Doesn't matter what it is, it's the wrong fit. It's because it is a Jesus shaped void in our hearts. This woman has been spending probably all of her adult life filling that emptiness with everything else. That emptiness is a desire built into you and to me that's filled only by Jesus that craves love. That craves love. We'll get into that in the last section. But Jesus says here, indeed, in verse 14, indeed, the water I give him will become in him 
a spring of water. Look at this. The word choice is beautiful. A spring of water welling up. Now, the NIV uses an unfortunate translation there. It's better translated as leaping. But spring of water leaping to eternal life. This word for spring is... is uh, it's, it's a source below the surface. So think of like a hot tub. You go in a hot tub, I'm, the, I'm the, the kid that wants to plug that jet to see if I can stop the water from coming. That, that's this, that jet. There is a below surface source that is pushing, pushing, providing, supplying. That's what this is. Jesus says, I will become in him. That spring of water, that source, that jet. This is what Jesus wants to do in you. Inside of you, he wants to be like that hot tub jet that, that provides the flow, provides the spring. Of what? He says, of water, the spring of living water, that, again, NIV says welling up. Better word would be leaping, like Acts chapter 3. When there was the, uh, the cripple. And it says that he leapt up. That's the same word here. The spring of water that is leaping in your lives to eternal life. What does this describe? The ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And how it is active. It's active. It's not stagnant. It's not boring. It's not something that you just have, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living water, active like a jet stream in the jacuzzi, always moving. That's the way that God designed our lives to be with the Holy Spirit. Guys, I don't want you to settle for a stagnant life with Jesus. He doesn't want you to settle for that. He wants to give you this living water. But like the woman, tonight, there's one thing that needs to happen before the living water can be active in your life. And this is last, the last section, starting in verse 15. This woman is longing for love, but in order for her to receive the love or even know about this love, she needs to be confronted first. Verse 15 says this. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She still doesn't get it. She's still focused on the physical. Okay, cool. You got un unlimited supply of water. Where is it? Let me, let me have some of that because you know what? It's tiring to come back here all the time. <laughs> it's tiring to come back here. And you know what? I'm always getting thirsty. If you have like a, a permanent hose that you can give me, then I don't have to get thirsty anymore. She doesn't get it. But Jesus explains, understanding that she doesn't get it, he gets right to the root. Verse 16 says, he told her, go get your husband and come back. I had no husband. And you can almost hear the snarkiness in her response. Like, oh, you thought you got me. I don't got a husband. She replied, and Jesus said to her, you were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had, and I want you to focus on these two things here, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What is he saying? Obviously, he knows her story. He knows everything that she's hiding. Jesus knows everything you're hiding. He knows everything about you that you don't tell people about. You know this intellectually, so don't live your life as if he doesn't know. But what he tells you tonight is this. If you want the streams of living water that I promise to everyone who believes in me, we got to deal with this first. You see, this woman, longing for love, was lying. She was lying. Her life was a lie. Her life was a lie. And tonight, if you're here, and your life is a lie, I want you to know that these streams of living water is available to you if you repent. 
Jesus deals with her very directly when he says, go get your husband. He knows she doesn't have a husband. And so she responds like, I don't have one. And he says, yeah, you're right. And you're not lying, but your life is a lie. Because you've had five husbands. This is about her past. And he says, and right now, even the one you're with is not your husband. This is about her present. And he's saying, your past life is a lie. Your current life is not real. So when you ask for this living water, you say, give it to me. I want this living water. Do you know what you're asking? If you want it, you need to repent. And I will give you streams of living water. The thing I want you to know before we close here tonight is this. The reason why I said this woman is just like us is because we all have a past. We all do. And to ignore it and pretend like we don't, when whatever it is, it's different. But to ignore it is naive. But we don't live in the past. Jesus has forgiven us of our past. And what he's telling this woman is what he would tell you tonight. Let the grace of God dominate your life today. The old is gone and the new has come. If you are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. None. So don't let your past limit what God wants to do today. God has wonderful plans for this woman. God has wonderful plans for you. And if you live according to your past, you're never going to escape it. If you let people, people's words about your past drag you into the past, that means you're still living in it. What Jesus says today is this, through the Apostle Paul, one thing I do, one thing I do, Philippians chapter 3, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I want you to know this. Jesus is not finished with you. If you have a past that you're embarrassed of, if you have a past that overshadows you, that's not who you are anymore. That can is dead. That old you is dead. And you walk into the newness of life that Jesus offers through this living water. Jesus loved this woman enough to be very direct with her. You see, she was looking for love that allows her to sin. That's not love. Jesus showed her real love by calling out her sin. It's not something that can be avoided if you want the living water, the streams of living water in your life tonight, it's available to you. Let the Lord deal with your heart. Can I have the men and women from the pastor's class come up as we close in a word of prayer?